This video is sponsored by Factor. The Megalodon was the largest shark to ever exist that we know of, but they were not alone at the top of the food chain millions of years ago. Allow me to introduce you to the Leviathan whale, the only known competitor and potential predator of the Megalodon. Despite being lesser known, Leviathan inhabited the same waters at the same time as the Megalodon, competing for the same food sources, and they likely ate each other at least a little bit. So of course, the question becomes, in a head-to-head -head battle, who would win? Today, we're gonna answer that question. I'm gonna introduce you to Leviathan, catch you up to speed on some new Megalodon research, and give you a winner based on the stats presented to you. As always, we gotta get the general information out of the way. I'm gonna give you a well-rounded understanding of each of the species, so we're all on the same page about what the fuck they got going on. Starting out with our main man, the Megalodon, scientifically Otis Megalodon. They were the largest sharks to ever exist that we know of, and were alive between 23 to 3.6 million years ago, AKA a long fucking time. Based on their fossilized teeth found on every continent except Antarctica, they were all over the place, tearing shit up globally for about 20 million years. Their teeth, which could get to about seven inches long, have been found in the bones of different prehistoric whales and seals, and bite marks on these bones even survived the fossilization process over millions of years. If you watch my other recent video on prehistoric sharks, AKA ratfish, you know that sharks, skates, rays, ratfish, sawfish, all exist in a group called chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish. They have skeletons made of cartilage, not bone. So their skeletons don't really fossilize. So all that's left is just a shit ton of teeth. Only under extremely rare and perfect conditions can a little bit of this cartilage be preserved. And this has only happened a couple of times with megalodon fossils in the form of vertebrae, and I want to say part of their jaw. I thought I read that in one of the papers, but then I couldn't find it again, so take that for what it is. The point is, most of what we know about Megalodon has been determined from their teeth, along with the ultra-rare cartilaginous remains and bite marks on their unsuccessful attempts to eat. This has led to a lot of different estimations and processes for determining those stats over the years, which, by the way, science has known about Megalodon since, like, 1835. So, some changes have been made to say the least. One thing that seems to be in agreement is they had a mouth like nobody's business with 276 razor sharp teeth that when combined gave them a mouth that was nine by 11 feet big, open wide. They could have swallowed you and your entire family at the same time. Well, that's probably the upper estimate. So let's just say you and a friend could have swallowed you and a pal. Their bite force also seems to have been nuts with max estimates placing it at 40,000 pounds per square inch. For comparison, humans have a bite force of like 120 pounds per square inch. This is the strongest bite force of any animal to ever exist that we know of. What has fluctuated dramatically over the years is our understanding of their size, how big they can get. Early estimates put them at 80 feet long in 1909, even 100 feet long in 1922. I blame prohibition. Let me actually explain how science has even come up with those size estimates from just a shit ton of teeth. Drum roll, please. Ratios. Ratios. This is not gonna turn into a math class, I swear to God. Scientists essentially take living species that are thought to be more closely related to the megalodon, in this case, great whites, use their measurements like tooth measurements, compared to their overall body length, figure out what relationship that is, and then apply to the megalodon. This is like the most dumbed down way to describe it, but you remember those, um, wait, hold on. Where's my marker? You remember this shit in sixth grade? Like, like this shit, and then you'd have to like cross multiply to find X. The body size of Megalodon is X in this scenario. This is a really shitty analogy. Okay, whatever. If you got it, good. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. So as time has gone on, equations have shifted, variables used have been shifted. So today there are just like so many size estimates for the Megalodon using all different variables. They range from like 30 to 65 feet, which honestly might just be the size range that existed anyway, because that's what we see with animals today anyway. So regardless, they were humongo. I was planning to end the quick stats there and then move on to the Meg's competitor, the Leviathan Whip. However, as luck would have it, some new research was published about the Megalodon that is very relevant to this video. As I was researching it, it was literally just published. Would you believe the luck of that? Remember the placoid scales I talked about in the last shark video, prehistoric shark video, the skin teeth? If you haven't seen that video yet, I suggest you do. You would like it if you're here, but I'll do a quick recap anyway. So, sharks and other chondrichthians are covered in what are called placoid scales. They have a core of dentine with an enamel-like covering. And you know what else has dentine and enamel? Teeth, placoid scales, skin teeth. Even though they are very small and thin, they're fairly resistant to decay and sometimes survive the fossilization process. So they're just out there in the fossil record, just difficult to find. But a group of researchers were able to identify placoid scales in the surrounding rock or matrix of a set of megalodon teeth found in Japan. Megalodon placoid scales. Different groups of sharks have differently shaped placoid scales, which can tell a lot about how water moved around the scales and thus how fast the animal was. In this case, the megalodon's placoid scales did not match those of active, fast swimming sharks, which generally have narrowly placed ridges or keels all over them. They actually seem to be more characteristic of an average swimming shark that occasionally had quick bursts of speed to snatch prey. 
this is a plot twist. Because the Megalodon had previously been determined to be partially warm-blooded or endothermic, producing their own body heat, which is a characteristic of modern, active, swimming, fast, hunting sharks. So this also led to new insights on how they burned all that metabolic heat they produced. Rather than using it as active swimmers, as they thought they did, it seems as though the warm-bloodedness allowed them to digest larger pieces of food, absorbing and processing the nutrients more efficiently. And speaking of processing nutrients, I think now is a good time to introduce you to today's sponsor, Factor. Factor is the ultimate solution for all your summer meal needs. I think we're all aware at this point that the research for these videos often kicks my ass. It can be hard to consistently get to the grocery store, and there are plenty of days where I've just ended up eating peanut butter and a bag of rice. So Factor has been a game changer for me, cutting down on my grocery trips and cooking time, giving me more time to get things done. I know I can rely on Factor to provide me with delicious, ready to eat meals, giving me the fuel for whatever I'm doing. Factor is also incredibly flexible. I can easily adjust my order size to fit my needs, just in case I wanna eat with my friends, or even skip a week if I want to. They've got tons of options that make it easy to find different meals based on dietary preferences. And they have these smoothies and juices that are perfect for this summer heat. Factor is my go-to when I'm on the run, working from home, or just too busy to cook. No matter where I am, I can enjoy a solid, well-rounded meal in just two minutes. I know you're probably thinking, like takeout exists, but Factor is not only cheaper than takeout, their meals are ready faster than restaurant delivery in just two minutes. You can also be rest assured that you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. That is bomb. You can head to factor75.com and use the coupon code LindsayNicole50 for 50% off your first box. I mean, it can't get any better than that. So if you're looking for a sustainable, hassle-free way to make the most of your summer, I highly recommend giving Factor a try with their fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door. You can focus on what truly matters, getting stuff done and having a good time. All right, moving on to the Leviathan whale. If you've never heard of it, there's a chance you're confused on how you've gone this long without hearing about this giant, fucking, apparently ferocious, big fucking whale. The shark is all over the place, so how did the whale get left in the dust? The simple answer is that they were only discovered recently in 2008. The Meg has been known for nearly 200 years. 200 years of discovering new shit with new techniques, franchising the shit out of them, gaslighting people into thinking that they're actually still alive in the deep ocean. While the Leviathan whale has only been known to science for 15 years. Well, technically they weren't described until 2010, so we could technically say they've only been known to science for 13 years. They're scientifically in middle school. Luckily though, what's been unearthed about this pubescent fossil has been able to get scientists a good idea of what they got going on. Actually, let me just make a quick note about their name because every time I talk about them on TikTok, I get a ton of comments like, you're pronouncing Leviathan wrong. So yeah, Leviathan is in reference to the mythical sea monster Leviathan. It's just the Hebrew spelling. It was actually initially named Leviathan Melvili, 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 Leviathan Melvili, Melvili after the author of Moby Dick, Herman Melville. But it turned out Leviathan as a scientific name was already used for a mastodon. And with how the scientific naming system works, that shit does not fly. Like the whole point of scientific names is so that you have one name to describe one species and you cannot possibly get it mixed up with anything else. No matter what language you speak, that's the shit. That, that's, that's it. So they had to change it to Leviathan Melvili, again, the Hebrew spelling, and that's just what it is. So Leviathan Melvili was a sperm whale that was first discovered in Peru in 2008. Individual teeth of this species have been found all over the world for over a century. So scientists knew that at some point there was some prehistoric sperm whale in the ocean about 10 million years ago, but it was kind of just left at that for a while. I don't know how they were able to gloss over that, but whatever. The fossil that was unearthed in Peru changed everything. It was a preserved skull that was nearly 10 feet long, just the skull. 10 feet long, which based on modern sperm whale comparisons suggests this species could get to 45 to 60 feet long, about the same size as a modern male sperm whale. So why all the fuss? Why were they thought to be so ferocious? Well, the real nightmare was their mouth. Cause unlike their modern counterparts, which only had lower jaw teeth used for suction feeding on giant big ass squid, Leviathan had teeth in both their upper and lower jaw. And these teeth could get to a foot long. Yeah, like the Subway sandwich. Well, like the old Subway sandwich. The largest biting teeth of any animal to ever exist. That we know of. These two characteristics suggest they were chomping like nobody's business. These bitches had an entirely different hunting and feeding strategy than their modern counterparts. Based on the characteristics of the jaw bones, Leviathan also had much larger attachment areas for the temporalis, the primary jaw closing muscle that were actually much more similar to modern killer whales, which suggests Leviathan might have occupied an orca-like niche 
just on a larger scale. How's that for fucking terrifying? Their mouth was about six by four feet open wide, so definitely not as gaping as that of the Megalodon, but I'd still argue large enough to swallow you and a friend. At least two short people, so like me and a friend. And on top of the fossil skull is this large concave surface, similar to that of today's sperm whales, which housed the spermaceti organ and the melon, two organs used in echolocation. So they were likely able to echolocate. And like other mammals alive today, the Leviathan was most definitely endothermic, which means that just like the Megalodon, the Leviathan whale would have had really high caloric requirements for their metabolism, so they likely also ate seals and other whales alive at the time. The fossil teeth, which have been found in Peru, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, North America, and the North Sea, suggest the Leviathan had a worldwide distribution about 10 to 5 million years ago. Again, since this species is newly discovered to science, I'm gonna guess that time period is gonna either expand or shift a little bit. We just don't know enough about them yet to say for sure what the fuck was going on. But despite that, we can definitely very confidently say at some point, the Megalodon and the Leviathan whale inhabited the same waters at the same time, likely for a very long time. So head to head, who would win? Well, there's good news and bad news. I'm gonna start with the bad news first. We don't know. We cannot say for sure, for a few reasons. Obviously this question depends on the size of the individuals in question. So let's just assume average stats across the board for the two species. That aside, the Leviathan whale still requires a lot more research, new fossil discoveries to create a more well-rounded understanding of what they had going on as a species. And I know this is upsetting to hear, but welcome to science, bitch. Nothing is ever given to you straight, but good news. Here's the good news. I'm willing to have fun with it because who gives a fuck? We're just going to make assumptions, okay? For the sake of this video, we're going to make assumptions. Let's assume that the relationship between the Megalodon and the Leviathan whale was kind of like that of today's great white sharks and orcas. Since they both occupied those niches on a larger scale, they occupied similar habitats, at least temporarily, overlapping territory, going after the same prey sources, and occasionally bumping into each other for a little tussle or even a little bite. My money's on the whale. Like, done. Done deal for me, personally. <laughs> Don't put that in. While the Megalodon might have been stronger, had a more powerful bite, the Leviathan whale had the upper hand of mammalian intelligence, which we have seen time and time again. We bitches in the dust. I mean, there are two orcas ripping out the livers of great white sharks in South Africa right now. Like that is currently happening. That shit is calculated. Based on the fact that it's happening right now, I will put my money on the whale. But I would love to hear what you think in the comments. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video coming out next week. You can check out my weekly live streams on Patreon and we just added a Discord server there. And you can keep up with my regular short form content on TikTok and Instagram. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya. I got a package. We're not gonna include that. Just scratch that. I got a package. And my door, I just left my door open while I was saying all that. Okay.